Support for Carolina Business Review is provided by Grant Thornton. Operating in more than 100 countries, our tax, audit, and advisory professionals specialize in helping companies unlock their growth potential. Blue Cross Blue Shield of South Carolina. Please visit us at SouthCarolinaBlues.com. And Sunoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and provider of packaging services with more than 300 operations in 35 countries. Someone recently said that things are getting better and better, worse and worse, faster and faster. That certainly seems oddly prophetic. Welcome again to the most widely watched source of Carolina business and public policy seen every week here in North and South Carolina. I am Chris William and no doubt that even against the backdrop of one of the longest but slowest economic expansions, the velocity of change and advancement can still seem dizzying. Some are left further and further behind while others are further ahead. We will try our best to tease out the sensibility of what is important to know now. And later on, the CEO of Real Estate Investment Trust that has truly excelled, Ed Fritch from Highwoods Properties. Major funding also by Novant Health, bringing you world-class technology, clinicians, and care when and where you need it. The Duke Endowment, a private foundation enriching communities in the Carolinas through higher education, health care, rural churches, and children's services. And by Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina, who's responsible for rising health care costs? Join us and many others in a candid discussion at letstalkcost.com. On this edition of Carolina Business Review, Lou Ebert from the North Carolina Chamber, Bob Quinn of SCRA, and special guest Ed Fritch, President and CEO of Highwoods Properties, Inc. Welcome to our program. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Bob, good to have you here. Thank you, Lewis, Chris. welcome back. Thanks, so, Chris. Lewis, we've got a, you know, arguably a pretty strong economy. Maybe not as strong as it's been in the past, but a lot of, uh, many years here of economic growth. I mean, one of the longest in the last 140 years. Doesn't that give us coverage to really make some sensible and, and larger investments in capital investments like education, like infrastructure? Yeah, absolutely it does. And I think uh, p part of where I think North Carolina has benefited you have to put the context of how bad the downturn was for our state. In 08, uh, we had one of the highest unemployment rates in the country and North Carolina was really struggling. And since that time, we've made some fundamental changes to the business climate that have made our state a lot more attractive and a lot more competitive, mm -hmm. uh, looking at tax structure, regulations, the legal climate, and a number of other things that were really impediments to job growth. And then what's happened since then is, we've been at the receiving end of significant new jobs probably in the last seven or eight years, half million new jobs in our state. And, and as that's happened, Chris, it's allowed the economy to grow, uh, more economic throughput, the, but the state budget's grown, and it's allowed us to invest exactly in the things you've mentioned. So we were uh, among the few states in America that invested a billion two every biennium now in infrastructure as we accommodate this growth. Uh, we've seen teacher pay go up each of the last three years, and will probably go up again this year. We've made ongoing investments in education, and, and even now we find ourselves halfway through the state's fiscal year, there's about a $400 million surplus again mm -hmm. on top of a rainy day fund. So I think our, our leaders have been very good stewards of our state's resources and absolutely gives us a chance to invest in our priorities. And, and, and Bob, I want to be careful not, not just laying the blame at the foot of legislatures uh, and, and is the State House in Columbia, but do lawmakers, should they be more uh, progressive in laying out plans for, uh, in, in the case of South Carolina, infrastructure? Doesn't that make sense when you've got a good economy, now is the time to be a little bit bolder? Sure, but um, in the case of South Carolina, there are some countervailing forces that somewhat restrict the, the legislature. For example, uh, they're grappling with a public pension fund that, depending on who you listen to, is anywhere from 20 to 40 billion dollars underfunded. That's certainly a challenge. Mm -hmm. um, however, for the, for the first time in a long time, there is serious consideration about raising the gas tax. Um, we're second only to Alaska in terms of our current gas tax of 16 cents a gallon. 
there's now legislation uh, that has been introduced that will raise that 10 cents a gallon over the next five years. That'll provide a tremendous amount of resources to deal with our, our roads. Uh, we also have other infrastructure issues related to uh, in, in the wake of the thousand year flood as well as uh, Hurricane Matthew uh, that we're dealing with as well. Does, does, does whoever's in the executive mansion, does that play well into uh, a little bit of this dynamic that you're talking about? Nikki Haley was against a sales tax increase. <clears throat> Dead sense, it, it never even wavered on that. Do you think McMaster is going to relent uh, to some degree? Uh, he hasn't uh, shown his cards on that to this at this point, uh, but in, every indication is that uh, he should be supportive. Yeah, and same thing in North Carolina, though. There was, you know, no love lost to some degree, at least publicly, between uh, uh, former go Governor McCrory and, and legislators. Uh, you've, we've got a new governor in North Carolina. How is that going to work? How is that going to unfold? Well, you know, we're lucky in this state, Chris, because some of the most important corporate leaders in this state got together about four years ago and said, you know, we probably ought to have our own plan for North Carolina's future that's not political or partisan and, and recognizes that uh, administrations will change and come and go. But what's the constant? So what we're focused on are the same four big things year in and year out. And we work with Republicans and Democrats to make sure we're investing in education, infrastructure, keeping our state competitive and growing entrepreneurship and innovation. And uh, regardless of who's the governor, regardless of who's in charge of the legislature, we, 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 we're busy delivering that message and driving our agenda to make sure North Carolina continues to be the most competitive state. So that, that's, the big, that, that's the way North Carolina wins. So when you facilitate those dialogues, both of you all, when you facilitate those dialogues, in the case how you just articulated that, Lou, does it, does it trump policy and calculus completely upend whatever modeling you've done to say, well, in North Carolina, we, we want to do this, but now we're hearing something different out of the feds? Well, you know, it, it might, but I, I think what we have put in place here is a way for uh, policy to trump politics. And a great example is that $1.2 billion in infrastructure. When we pulled that issue three years ago, there was nobody on board, and, and the politicians could have easily said, we're just not gonna do that. Mm -hmm. But I think we're able to make the business case that talks about, here's how this advances our economy and grows jobs. Uh, we have a chance to make our case. And, and then I think, you know, when you overlay that on what's happening in Washington, uh, you know, it's hard to say early on what impact that'll have. Uh, and, and I'm not saying it won't have any impact, but what we're finding more and more is the actions in the states. When I look around the country where big things are happening to drive economic prosperity and growth, States and state chambers and state organizations have been enormously successful, just as we have here, in, in working on the big things that make their states more competitive. Yeah, Bob, same question. Yeah, yeah the, so the key is, is to put structures and, and plans in place that uh, will succeed regardless of what happens at, at the federal level, and to not use available resources smarter. So let me give you one example. Uh, last month, I executed an agreement with the presidents of MUSC, USC, and Clemson, under which it's a strategic collaboration agreement, uh, under which all of our interactions with not only those three institutions, but all academic institutions will be governed. And we've put together a, a committee with representatives from each one of those, those uh, um, institutions, mm -hmm. as well as the technical <coughs> college system, industry, uh, and the comprehensive teaching universities. And so this will allow us to go for federal grants in a, in a far more consolidated way. Um, historically, the universities have been competing against each other. Mm -hmm. Um, so it, it allows you to be smarter with available resources. But that, the, and not to, we've just got about 30 seconds left. Not to say, not to completely discount that, but you also can't completely discount the impact of what, if in, 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 let's talk about South Carolina, what federal transportation dollars could do go a long way in the Palmetto State that has arguably the worst roads in the nation in one of the largest networks of roads. Uh, but fair enough. Uh, the um, it remains to be seen how that plays out. Yeah, okay. All right, we, uh, we spent a lot of time on that. Gentlemen, thank you. We're going to meet our guest in just a moment. Next week on this program, she has been here before. She argues a good case for education. 
uh, and education in South Carolina. Her name is Molly Spearman. She is the superintendent of education in the Palmetto State. She will be back. And then in two weeks, uh, an interesting man. He has uh, uh, a couple big responsibilities, and they are not just passing either. He's the president of the American Hospital Association in this nation. He's also the newly named chief executive officer of one of the nation's largest health care systems, certainly the largest health care system in the Carolinas. His name is Gene Woods, and he will be our guest uh, coming up here on Carolina Business Review. In general, commercial real estate prices have expanded 60 percent the last five years. That is a pace faster than the housing market in general. Those who work in and around the commercial space remember all too well the lessons from the Great Recession, I am sure. Joining us again is one such executive and leader. He spearheads a real estate investment trust with about 30 million, 31 million square feet of space and almost 700 million in annual revenue. We welcome back to the program the president, chief executive officer, and director of Raleigh's Highwoods Properties, Ed Fritch. Ed, welcome back. Thanks, Chris. Glad to be here. When you think about where you are now, and, and Ed, not just with 31 million square feet and uh, uh, several hundred employees and where you're going and how your stock's done and uh, kind of the, the, the great summertime and making hay in the summer, but Ed, when you reflect back on where you were in 08, 09, and the depths of, of where commercial real estate, how does that in, it kind of inform what you do now and your decisions now to not repeat what happened? Well, I think a lot of people burn their hand on the stove in, in that period of time, and you know, those scars and those soft tissues are still there. And I think the biggest transformation since that point in time, um, not just in our business, but businesses across as well as households, is the, the writing of the balance sheet. Um, people are carrying less debt. Entities are carrying less debt. We're carrying significantly less debt than we were at that point in time. Uh, a lot of our peers had to cut their dividend during that period of time. We were fortunate that we didn't have to do that. Um, and we're the only office REIT that didn't do that. Um, but it, it was a credit crunch. Times were tough. And I think that the efforts that have been made subsequent to that as a result of that, that uh, terrible recession, and we've all made significant moves on our balance sheet and carrying much less debt. Now, the cost of debt will change over time. It does ebb and flow. But I'd be surprised if a lot of companies go back to really tooling up on the level of debt that they're mm -hmm. carrying. But w w if you can take fiscal austerity out of it and lessons learned from the balance sheet and income statement, I mean, how does it change the way you think strategically when you're talking about either deploying or acquiring new assets? Well, that's the whole game, right? When do you deploy? What do you acquire? How much do you put out? When do you dispose of assets? When do you cull your portfolio? And, and when do you choose to develop? So those are really the three weapons aside from the financial engineering aspect of it. But you have to take together all the telltales and try and decide what, which decision you want to make today. Do you deploy? Do you dispose? Do you develop? And there are a lot of, there's a huge matrix of things that goes into that calculation. Um, and there are, we've been doing it for a long time and we try to study it and the goal is to get it right more often than we get it wrong. Yeah. Uh, sometimes we do get it wrong, but uh, real estate's been a good industry uh, for a considerable period of time. Coming out of the recession, uh, as you said in your opening remarks, um, I think that the recovery's been slower than we all ex wanted it to be at the outset, but we've avoided the live fast, die young uh, as a result of that. And so, yes, the cadence has been slower, but I think game may have been over by now had it been at the pace that we all really wanted mm -hmm. it to be at coming out of that credit crunch. Mm -hmm. Lou? Yeah, Ed, you know, you, you do business in a lot of states uh, around the country, a lot of states where economic activity is pretty strong. I guess what, what would be the couple things you've observed in those states that uh, make their economies better or worse than North Carolina? What, what, what might we learn from those states in your experience? Well, I think, uh, you know, I'm grossly biased, but I think North Carolina competes very well. And I think the Sun Belt as a, a collection, a region, uh, does extremely well. And, and we have that to our advantage. Um, the fact that our portfolio is predominantly in the Sun Belt, I think, is a distinct competitive advantage. Right to work states, uh, cost of living, 
the university system that we have here, the work ethic that we have here, population growth that's disproportionate to most areas of the rest of the country, all those things uh, are in our favor. And so with the migration of business, the migration of people, and all the infrastructure that's there and the things that I listed and others, mm -hmm. I think it makes for a very compelling argument. Throw on top of that quality of life here, I think it's a compelling story, and I think the southeastern Sunbelt states will continue to do well over time. Ed, what type of criteria do you use in vetting new opportunities, entering new markets, um, developing new properties, and have those criteria evolved over the years? Sure, they've evolved, but it, it is a complex matrix, uh, but some of it's objective, some of it's subjective, some of it's art, some of it's science, and some of it's just your gut. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think that it's varied. Uh, some of it is analytical um, and what we do with the balance sheet and, and when the timing is, is good and bad, but it's such a wide spectrum um, that I think the best thing to do is, is to address it in a collaborative approach, which, which is what we do in our shop. Um, our senior leadership team gathers on lots of topics and we take good advantage of your background, your background, your expertise, what you've done in your career to try and come to a good decision. So I know I've, I've kind of avoided a, a direct answer to that, but it really depends on a lot of things and you have to amass that to decide which direction should we go. And some are obvious, uh, but some are not so obvious. And I think uh, the ones that are not so obvious um, tend to either have good upside, you know, the, the beta is different mm -hmm. on, on that. And so it's just a matter of which, when you choose to break out of the crowd, and is it, is it good that you did that? Yeah. Were you good to be first in? Or were you first in and ended up to being bleeding edge? Yeah. Well, when you take, so when you're talking about kind of leveraging off the, not just the, the legacy and the history of the talent bench that you have in your firm, Ed, but now you've got disruptors, you've got technology that's really upended a lot of things. You have Airbnb. You know, it's the largest lodging company that doesn't own a stick of real estate. You've got Uber, you've got Amazon, and all of these have been traditionally commercial real estate clients to some degree. So how do you kind of look around the corner and say, where we need to be, though, is X, and we don't even know, I guess, how that, how that played out even 10 years ago. It's a, it's a different environment. So how do you make sure your portfolio is in the right place? Well, I think uh, there's, there's no way to top quality. And we all learned it uh, when we first started thinking about business and the economy and what we do is location, 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 whether it's where you buy your house or where we buy and invest in a piece of land or build a building, location is, is key. And so being in the right location with the right product is, is important and I think that will carry the day. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's very uh, critical to how we decide where we're gonna be. But you know, those transforming things are, are very important. Um, just the amount of glass that you put on a building today can be a differentiator for whether or not a customer wants to be in that building or not. You know, how much outside awareness am I going to have? How big is my floor plate? What's my parking ratio? So parking ratios today is a big criteria when people decide where to lease space. And so if the autopod comes around and you know, all four of us got here by way of an autopod that we put back into service the moment we got out of it and we no longer need our individual cars, how will that impact? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, seeing around the corner is difficult. I think we're fortunate that we have a pretty large petri dish from which we experience every day, you know, what are the needs, the wants, the desires of folks. And the way that suburban office space is consumed today is different than it was before. The way downtown office space is consumed today is different than the way before. And so you have to be adaptive and anticipating for that. And a big part of that is to walk the shop floor, be with your customers, understand what the industry is doing and what people want to be. Mm -hmm. And you have to be able to uh, be in a position to react or anticipate and deliver that. Mm -hmm. Just kind of curious how the nature of work is affecting the facilities that you own because I, I, I'm in offices a lot more and more, uh, you know, on a daily basis. And it, it seems like there's, uh, you know, fewer offices, more open space, you know, the corner office is probably a thing of the past. And it seems like more modern workspaces and probably your, your, your clients are putting pressure on you. How, how do you accommodate just the changing nature of work? People are working from at home, uh, you know, coming into the office isn't the way it used to be. So how, how do you think about that in terms of how you're investing and how you're fitting out your buildings? 
It's a great question. And I think that's a pendulum that is in perpetual movement. It's, it's never going to come to rest. It's like our ties, fat, wide, fat, wide. I mean, they're just, mm -hmm. that's how you keep selling them. So you, we have to think about the infrastructure. So is the plate good? Is the glass good? Is the outside awareness good? Is the parking good? Is the location good? All the services good? All that's then how you build out your space inside. You can be, you can be flexible with that. But I, I've been at iWoods going on 35 years, and I can tell you there was a time whenever we built out a customer space, I knew pretty much where the break room was going. Right. Somewhere in the core, no windows, it was small, there was a drink machine, a machine to get nabs, a, you know, a laminate table, and that was about it. And now it's, it, it is the corner office, mm -hmm. and there's a sub-zero refrigerator, there's a foosball table, there's a plasma screen, there's upholstered furniture. It's expansive, and it's inviting. And so that, you know, it's a dramatic change. So maybe the space that's been allocated to me is less, but the we space mm -hmm. is greater. Yeah. And no better example is, is that break room and then extrapolate that sure. uh, across the board. So I, I, it was interesting. I was on a panel recently and I asked the other uh, panelists just out of curiosity, are you in office or a cube, office or a cube? And the most stunning answer uh, was this one lady said, I have both. <laughs> she wanted to be with her group and be collaborative and she has a cube but she also wants her office to where she can go and have peace and quiet and do the right. contemplative type of work that she likes to do and so I think that you have to have a building that offers that flexibility so that you're in a good location have good windows have good amenities have good access uh, but the build out is forever changing mm -hmm. yeah. so a variation on Lou's question describe what the commercial real estate market looks like 10 years from now well, I think it will continue to move, and I, it's difficult to project that. I would say it's difficult in some states, to, in some situations, to say just five years from now on how it continues to change. Um, I was in a meeting yesterday where we were talking with a customer who brought up they want to de-densify. They've, they've, con they've given up too much space. They have too many people, in their view, in too small a space. And they went from offices to open landscape, and they found that it negatively impacted productivity and morale. Just the noise, the volume, too much togetherness, maybe. Yeah. Think about the, you know, the family vacation. <laughs> it was great. We're glad to get back to work maybe at the end of that, at the end of that week and have some more. So I think that uh, it will forever ebb and flow. Um, and it will be interesting to see what millennials want when they get, become older. Do they still want that collaborative and to be working at a table together or do they want a little bit more privacy and, and uh, the ability to do that without going into a, a glass cube in the middle of the floor to do that? Well, and, the, and to take that thought to the next level too, as you, as you use your uh, metaphor about the pendulum head, uh, so we've got a preponderance of apartment homes and everyone said, well, that's the thing to be. So when does that, when do we hit the end of that uh, inventory that cycle and what do you do beyond that where what what what's the next springboard from apartment homes yeah so apartments is a you know that's a tough guess and we're, we're not in that business but obviously we observe it and we interact with it in the way that we're our proximities etc but you know part of that is that we have a generation now that just saw their parents lose the equity in their home you referenced mm -hmm. the 0809 time frame, and, and that hadn't happened in generations. And that had so long been the way I was going to get ahead is build up the equity in this house. And I'm all said, the other thing is, um, you know, my dad was with Westinghouse his entire career. I've been at Highwoods for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, younger people now, you know, it's, it's not a big deal to change jobs. You know, it, it, it changed jobs, changed locations. And so, Having the boat anchor, mm -hmm. uh, the ball and chain of, mm -hmm. of, of a home and not having the flexibility to move around and take other jobs and experience other things, that's, that's different from today's culture. So maybe the multifamily provides them with that ability to do that. But what happens when they have the 2.3 kids? Mm -hmm. you know, hey, Junior, go out and mm -hmm. play on the balcony. You don't have the backyard. You don't have the basketball court in the driveway. So you know, it'll be interesting to see what their wants and desires are, and will it still be the independence uh, and the size and the convenience of mm -hmm. apartment living, or will it migrate into a home? And I think it's a different equation in Chicago. You know, in the in the big cities, it's different because of the commutes and the, and the pricing. Whereas you can get a decent house at a decent price with a backyard and a grill and a garage you know, in, 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 this, in, the mm -hmm. cell, in the Sun Belt in the southeastern states. It's a very doable thing and it provides a different lifestyle. Mm -hmm. 
Ed, thank you. Uh, I wish we had more time. I wanted to talk to you about where, when do you think this cycle ends? You said, you know, five years, but we're going to we're going to sit on that for now. Thank you yeah. for being our guest on the program. Good to see you again. Yeah, Congratulations. Thank you, Chris, yeah. very much. And to you. Thank you. Uh, Bob, good to have you uh, at SCRA. Good luck with that. We didn't get a chance to talk about strategy change because I know you're heading in a different direction. Yeah. Uh, and, Lou, I know you got your annual meeting come up at the Grand Over, yes, and I, uh, always a well-attended event. Thank, thank you. you for being here. Thanks, Chris. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, and please take time, carolinabusinessreview.org. Uh, watch programs, make comments. Until next week, I'm Chris William. Hope your business is good. Good night. Major funding for Carolina Business Review was provided by the Duke Endowment, a private foundation enriching communities in the Carolinas through higher education, health care, rural churches, and children's services. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina. Who's responsible for rising health care costs? Join us and many others in a candid discussion at letstalkcost.com. Grant Thornton, operating in more than 100 countries, our tax, audit, and advisory professionals specialize in helping companies unlock their growth potential. Novant Health, bringing you world-class technology, clinicians, and care when and where you need it. Sunoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and provider of packaging services with more than 300 operations in 35 countries. Blue Cross Blue Shield of South Carolina. Please visit us at SouthCarolinaBlues.com. And by viewers like you. Thank you. Promotional consideration provided by Business North Carolina Magazine. For more information, visit carolinabusinessreview.org.